Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. And I guess if I should, yes, excellent. Thank you. Well, if you allow me, I, I will start with a little uh, technology-related anecdote. Otherwise, this will not be a conference on the future of work. Someone has got to teach Google Maps about altitude. If you're down there in a hotel, it cannot tell you that it's going to take you five minutes to get up here, because uh, then uh, you meet all of a sudden a big uh, staircase going up, and you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> so maybe there's still a role for people after all. So my name is Paolo Falco. I'm at, uh, in the Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs at the OECD. And essentially, we are the part of the OECD that deals with um, anything to do with the employment policy and social affairs. And in particular, I'm working on a project on the future of work, which uh, is our attempt to take a look at uh, how different megatrends are shaping the labor market and how policy should react to those megatrends. To give you a little bit more context, these are the megatrends we have in mind. Essentially, we try to focus on the ones where A, we believe most change is happening, and B, we've got the expertise in our directorate to intervene and analyze. Clearly, there are more than these. But uh, our priorities, at least uh, in the way we've set up our work, are the impacts of technology and digitalization of globalization and on uh, demographics, on uh, essentially what jobs will be created, what jobs will be destroyed, how, where, and by whom will these jobs be performed. Of course, as I said, you could add more to this picture. You could add climate change. You could add the uh, changing preferences of workers vis-a-vis -vis work, increasing preferences for flexibility, for example. These are all trends that are shaping the world of work. Somehow, they do feature in our analysis, but we choose to focus on these three megatrends, which are the ones that most prominently are talked about in the debate. And this is an activity that started uh, now um, over a year and a half ago um, with, uh, well, in fact, uh, two years ago, actually, with uh, an activity, with a forum that launched our um, work on the topic at the OECD. A little bit more in terms of numbers. When uh, we discuss these megatrends, it's important to put some facts on them. Well, the impact of uh, digitalization is clear. This is uh, one example of how digitalization and technology impact the labor market. In particular, I'm showing you the supply of industrial robots, which has increased pretty much threefold since 2003 and uh, is very much continuing to go up. This is possibly the most striking of the megatrends that uh, we should really keep in mind and we often overlook. We are clearly moving towards societies that are a lot older. And uh, while a lot of the analysis that uh, I'm going to show you today could be obviously debatable in terms of the assumptions, in terms of the analysis, in terms of the tools that are used to produce the results, this is pretty much a hard fact. This is not something that is going to change much from uh, what we predict, because our understanding of how demographics works over such a scale, over such a long, over such a, a time period, are pretty good. And essentially, the scary fact, if you will, or something that is well known, but something that we should really reflect upon, is that we're moving from a society where for every retired person there are four people in work to societies that by 2050, this is the OECD, will have two people in work for one person retired. And, and, and finally, I don't need to convince you, um, since we are in Estonia, and Estonia is clearly a very open economy, that uh, the economies of the world very much depend on international trade. So this is globalization. And if you look at uh, the number of jobs that directly depend on trade across the OECD, you put that figure at about 30% on average. So technology is diffusing. The world is, in is becoming an increasingly integrated place. Societies are aging. In what I'm going to show you today, I will focus in particular on technology and globalization, which are probably out of all the megatrends you can keep in mind, you can have in mind, the ones that have attracted the most hot debate throughout the world. First of all, let's start from the million dollar question. 
What can we expect from the fourth industrial revolution? I like to actually phrase this uh, question, which can be a bit generic on this slide, in a much more direct way. Are we all going to be unemployed because robots, machines, AI, and so on are taking our jobs? This is the work that uh, has been uh, um, initiated by a number of studies, among which you may have heard about uh, a famous study that came out of Oxford University by uh, um, Carl, Carl, Fle Carl Frey and Michael Osborne, who um, claimed that 47% of jobs in the United States are at risk of being automated away in what they didn't really give an exact time frame, what, what sounds like one or two decades. That number has sparked an enormous debate. It's obviously a huge number, 47% of jobs. What we've been doing at the OECD is revisit those figures using data that we have from a survey of adults at work, which allows us to look not at jobs as a whole, but as, at tasks within jobs. So we essentially can break down an occupation, what people actually do within those occupations, and we find that when you do that, even occupations that for the greater part look automatable have such variety of tasks within them that there will be still something that machines cannot do. And when you do that kind of analysis, you find that the actual number of jobs at risk of being completely automated away is much lower. And that number, in our calculations, is on average about 14% for the OECD. And this is uh, obviously still a significant number. It's a number, however, that uh, is very different from the 47% that everybody's talking about. Now, to be honest, I don't find this to be the most interesting question in the debate. I don't think the problem is how many jobs will be completely automated away. If anything, because this is a process of destruction and creation of jobs that goes on all the time and has been going on forever. Think about agriculture. Two centuries ago, virtually everybody worked in agriculture. Now, the percentage of people that work in agriculture is negligible. Has, an em has employment gone down? Has unemployment in society gone up? No, quite the opposite. We've never been as employed as we are today. Think about women at work. Most women did not used to be in the labor market two centuries ago. Today, entire sectors have gone, don't exist anymore. And employment, at the same time, has gone up massively, in particular with women joining the labor force. So what's going on? Well, it's the process of uh, job creation and job distractions that happens all the time. And this is why I don't think that what we should be worrying about necessarily is the fact that we are all going to be out of a job because machines are going to do everything for us. What we need to worry about is the fact that jobs are changing, that has always happened, possibly at a faster pace. At a faster pace because technology is now becoming so pervasive and is becoming so um, intrinsically part of the jobs that we do, and new technologies are coming in all the time, that the change that may be required may have become faster. And this is what I'm showing you now. If you do the analysis, and you don't focus necessarily on jobs that are at risk of being automated away for the most part, but the jobs that have a significant share of tasks that is going to change radically, you find that the percentage is much higher pretty much everywhere. So I'm now showing you the blue plus the gray bars, the jobs, the percentage of jobs whose tasks, where at least 50% of the tasks that workers do are going to change because of technology are going to be essentially replaced by technology and workers are going to be doing something else. Why is this a more important question? Well, because it tells you that it's not about people being out of a job. It's about people keeping a job that's going to change radically and they will have to adapt with it. Obviously, these are not necessarily the same people. There's going to be some people who are out of the market, some other people who come in. On average, employment, we don't necessarily expect will go down. What's key is helping people transition. And we'll go in, in, in a minute into the policies that are important for this. Before we go there, 
a little bit more on what are the occupations that are at most, at the highest risk of being radically changed, and what are the ones that are less likely to be radically changed. Well, here probably it won't come as a surprise to you that occupations that uh, involve a higher share of tasks that are innately human, if you will, so things to do with the presenting um, to others, influencing others, writing creatively, uh, training other people are going to be occupations that uh, are less at risk of automation because these are activities that machines don't go well with yet. And uh, obviously, tasks that are uh, more about exchanging basic information, buying and selling, things that algorithms are already good at doing, are obviously going to be more easily automated. Before we move to the next bit of the analysis I want to tell you about, I want to attach one big caveat to all of this and, uh, if I may, to the entire debate about the risk of automation that you may be reading about. We should not fall, we should not fall prey of what um, we call the fallacy of technological determinism. What is technological determinism? Is the idea that because a technology exists, somewhere in a lab, perhaps, it will inevitably take over the market and have a massive influence on, the, on, on jobs. Why is this a fallacy? Well, because there are a lot of other forces at play other than the existence of the technology that can have an impact on how quickly a technology diffuses. And here I'm going to give you a stark example. If you ask people, where do you see technology being most useful, and where would you rather not have technology, you get a strong degree of variation between sectors where people say, robots, yes, please, like space exploration, manufacturing, search and rescue missions, to, robot, to, to, to sectors where they say, mm, maybe not really, like healthcare. This is obviously one stark example but it speaks, in this particular instance, of people's preferences. We may not have a taste for that robot substituting our children when it comes to caring for us in old age, and therefore, when we look at the impacts of automation, we should keep that in mind. This is not to say that preferences are set in stone, preferences can change, but it's just one way of saying, let's please bear in mind that there is a whole set of forces regulating how technology diffuses, and other examples are very simply the relative balance of uh, labor and capital abundance in the economy, relative prices, regulation, institutions, laws that may facilitate or prevent the diffusion of technology, and all of this needs to be taken into account so that we don't fall prey of the fallacy that because AI can, in principle, do this, in 15 years, we've got to be scared that we are all going to be at risk because all our jobs are going to be taken away. Second question I want to present to you that comes out of our analysis. I've now told you about the impacts of automation and the impacts of technology in isolation. The second um, question we've tackled, and this is part of the Employment Outlook 2017, the last Employment Outlook that was released by the OECD, is the question of whether it's technology or globalization, so openness to the world, that has the strongest impact on the labor market. These two forces obviously go hand in hand. Disentangling them completely is tricky. You don't have technology. You don't have globalization without technology. Technology greatly diffuses thanks to globalization. So these are obviously two forces that uh, strengthen each other, if anything. But it's an interesting question nonetheless to pose because uh, it permeates very much the political debate wherever you look. In any political campaign you've seen in the last few years, and uh, think about the ones that have produced some very, very striking results. Think about Brexit. Think about uh, the election of uh, uh, Donald Trump. Think about uh, um, recent um, electoral uh, campaigns in Italy or France. The debate and uh, very often the rejection of uh, the status quo by a large and increasing 
group of society, an increasing part of society, typically, or very often, has two main culprits that uh, are pointed at as uh, potentially being destructive for jobs. Robots and cheap labor, which is typically in the form of migrants or in the form of uh, thir uh, you know, uh, third-party uh, countries, um, uh, countries um, other than in the domestic in foreign countries where labor is cheaper. And so we've asked the question, if we want to try to disentangle these two forces, what is it that plays the biggest role? Is it technology? Is it globalization? And in particular, what we've been asking is how do these two phenomena affect the industrial and occupational structure of the market? That means what sectors grow, what sectors shrink, and how occupations that require relatively high-skilled workers versus low-skilled workers develop. Why is this important? Well, first of all, on the different growth rates of different sectors, well, that's important because it speaks directly of a phenomenon that has been affecting advanced societies pretty much everywhere in the last 30 years. The phenomenon is deindustrialization. It's the fact that the manufacturing sector, pretty much wherever you look, has been shrinking. And this is directly related in the public debate to the fact that automation has taken jobs in the manufacturing sector, or that these jobs have simply been shifted away to countries where wages are lower. And this is something you pretty much see very, very starkly everywhere in the OECD. This is an average of OECD countries, but essentially all the sectors that have been shrinking are manufacturing sectors. The ones that have been increasing are service sectors. So the question number one in this part of the analysis we've been asking is uh, how, of, how do these two forces contribute to deindustrialization? The second question we've been asking is how do they contribute to something called job polarization? What is job polarization? Well, it's essentially the fact that, uh, again, pretty much wherever you look, with some exceptions, in the OECD, you find that uh, jobs that are in the middle of the skill distribution, you can think of them as the classic middle-class jobs, have been shrinking as a share of uh, total employment, while we've been predominantly creating jobs that either require very high skill or very low skill. You could say, this is an academic question, why do we care? Well, we care because, uh, among other things, it speaks directly of inequality. It speaks directly of the fact that the labor market is becoming one where if you want to have a job, you either have a, a very well-paid high-end job or you're going to be probably in the service sector and uh, with a job that pays relatively little. This is the story that's been mentioned earlier by Enrico Moretti, who says that uh, jobs from the IT sector, his story specific about IT jobs, create with a multiplier a higher number of jobs for every job created in the IT sector in services that are relatively low paid. And this is something that in the US, for instance, is clearly correlated with an increase in inequality, which, however, occurs pretty much anywhere. This is important. It's important because the fact that we lose these middle skill jobs has been linked directly to the political developments of the last few years. It's what makes a very big part of society very anxious. And that part of society is what is, what used to be, you could say, but still is, pretty much the middle class is the backbone of advanced societies, is the people who have these middle-skill jobs who, since the Second World War, have been doing relatively well because these jobs in factories, these jobs in basic manufacturing, not that basic very often, you know, the middle of the distributions, have been very much an engine of social mobility. They've given people opportunities. And these jobs have been taken away. These are the jobs that fall in the middle of that distribution with all the anxiety, very often with all the anger that comes with it. Think about the Rust Belt in the United States. That's a classic example. Car manufacturing, completely gone. That is the classic middle skill jobs, replaced by high-end jobs in technology-related sectors and low-end jobs 
that are the service sectors that uh, have been developing and where those workers were in the middle very often have been flowing. With all this premise, so having described the importance of the phenomenon, let me tell you which one of these two forces has played the biggest role. What we find in the employment outlook of last year is that technology is the force that is most directly related to the displacement of workers in middle skill jobs and to deindustrialization. Why is this important? Well, very simply, you could say I'm simplifying too much, but it's just to give you a stark view on this, because if you take this result to its logical implications, you realize that policies that aim to close borders, to shield countries from migration, to shield countries from globalization, are unlikely to bring back jobs. Because those jobs, very often, may simply have been automated away. Or because by closing borders, you may even increase the likelihood that technology will substitute workers because simply the market forces are such that the wage bill may be too high to foot for the employers. This is obviously a stark conclusion, one that, as I said, you should take with a grain of salt because these results obviously vary a lot by country and also it's difficult to disentangle technology and globalization so precisely, but this is what the correlations that we've been studying show. Very quickly, I'm going to talk about the third point that I'm not going to dedicate a lot of time to, but I want to mention because it's key also to the discussion. And it's something that we're going to be studying going further. And I should say that all the materials that I'm presenting today and more will be part of an employment outlook in 2019 released by the OECD that will be entirely dedicated to the future work. So it will be our compendium study that uh, will put forth all the materials that we've produced on the topic. Platform economy, the usual suspects, these firms, and a lot more. A good thing or a bad thing? Workers in these new jobs, are they essentially exploiting opportunities that did not exist before? Or are they instead just being placed upon a lot of risk that they did not used to have before? Are we moving more and more towards a society of self-employed people who have to take care of themselves? And if so, how should policy respond to these developments? These are the big questions in this area. It's a question where I'm afraid we still don't know a lot about. The numbers are very, very scattered. 0.5% of US workers work on platforms, 1% get some kind of income, 3% uh, in the UK, 5% in the Netherlands. The picture is very, very scattered. What we've been doing at the OECD is collaborate with the Oxford Internet Institute to try to get information on how many workers are working on a number of different platforms. And so far, what we've been able to say is something I would say relatively obvious at this point, but we're digging further, is that the trend is very much upwards. What's interesting, though, is that uh, while the supply of these jobs, the, fa uh, the, um, the, the, um, the workers that do these jobs are predominantly in low-wage countries, the demand for this work is pretty much an advanced economy. So we are witnessing very much a global labor market and one that is very unbalanced. So the increase is clear, but what's clear also is that a lot of these jobs are not done in the same countries where they are performed. Obviously, nothing is performed anymore anywhere specific. Everything is performed on some server in the Netherlands anyway. But uh, uh, the people who require these tasks are mostly in the United States. The people who supply these tasks are very often in uh, countries other than the United States with lower wages. Here I have more questions and answers to offer. We would like to know who these workers are, uh, what they do exactly, where they do it, and very importantly, is this a primary or supplementary source of income? This is something we'll be studying going for, uh, forward. And how much, obviously, do they make? And uh, to what extent can we call these jobs jobs in uh, the classic sense? And to what extent are they activities that uh, are on top of other jobs that people have? 
And finally, is this really a choice or is it something that people do out of necessity because they've got nothing else to do? Before I uh, move uh, to a policy discussion though, I would like to put this final question about platform work in a little bit of context. We are not really talking about something we've never seen before. This is another one of those cases where the OECD, and I feel like we've been doing it a lot, tries to put a little bit of calm on the general anxiety and tries to point people to the fact that some of the policy challenges we've been dealing with, we, we think we're dealing with for the first time, are policy challenges we've been dealing with for a long time. Non-standard employment, in the sense of self-employment, part-time work, and temporary employment, whether or not it is on platforms, whether or not it is online, whether or not you call it gig economy, has been existed for, existing for a long time. And it's not necessarily, at least not for the last 10 or 15 years, the, the, the very few last years may show a different trend, but it's not necessarily been increasing massively yet. What I'm trying to do here, though, is to show you that, for instance, by telling you that 16% of people are self-employed in the OECD, while the gig economy is still one, two, three percentage points, we need to worry about these people and we need to worry about the social policy for them and the labor market policies for them more broadly, whether or not you call them gig, you call them platform, you call them online. <coughs> these are issues that have always existed and in a minute I will tell you what to do, what we think we should be doing about that. And I'm going to conclude this analytical part of the presentation by adding something that comes from the very latest part of uh, our work, which uh, essentially complements the analysis on uh, the gig economy by asking another key question that everybody thinks has an answer to, but we're not quite sure they've got the right answer, and is, are jobs really becoming less stable? So if the gig economy is becoming more prevailing, if people are in and out of jobs more often, do we actually see in the data that uh, people work less in the same job than they used to do? Everybody would probably answer that question very often. Many people, I shouldn't say everybody, but many people will answer that question with a resounding yes, of course. I mean, I see people that uh, are in and out of a job a lot more. People hop around. People have more opportunities. People can go online and do something new all the time. Well, if you look at the data, you find that, in fact, the number of years that people spend in the same job so a, 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 an indicator of stability on the job has been increasing on average, which is quite the opposite of what you expect. There is a caveat, though, that uh, a lot of this has to do with aging. The fact that more old people are in the labor market means that, on average, people spend more time in their jobs, simply because there, are, there is a higher share of people who have been able to accumulate more by the mechanical fact that they're older. But this is in itself an important finding. Once you control for age, you do find that uh, there is a negative impact of uh, the recent developments in the labor market on the stability of jobs. So there is an uptick in instability. It is, however, a very small change compared to the very often overblown debate about increasing instability in the job market, and crucially, not shown here, but I should make this point, it's uh, an increase in instability that does not come from an increased rate of job-to-job -job transition, so increased opportunity. The fact that people move from a job to the next more quickly, it comes from the fact that people have a higher risk of unemployment. So it's not so much opportunity to move to your next job, that flow is down, is lower than it, is, than it was 10 years ago. People seem to have less opportunity to move from a job to the next quickly. What's gone up, possibly as the result of the crisis, is the risk that people lose their job. And the fact that it takes them a bit longer to get back to work. This may change. We might still be just seeing the lingering effects of the crisis, but it's something worth thinking about when uh, engaging in this debate about increasing mobility and increasingly dynamic labor markets. I'm going to spend the last few minutes I have now to tell you a little bit more about the policy 
solutions that uh, we can uh, distill out of this analysis. Obviously, at the OECD, that's the aim of our game. These are policy three. It's a, a possibly non-exhaustive list of areas where you can think we should do something in relation to what I've been talking about today, ranging from skills to social protection to labor market regulation, activation policies, collective bargaining, and social dialogue. Today, I'm just going to focus on skills and a little bit on social protection, and then I'll conclude. On the skill side, we've been saying that workers need to be able to change in order to have a job in the future. They need to be adaptable. So the first question a policymaker might want to ask is, do the workers have the skills that they're going to need in the future? And here I'm going to give you just one example of those skills. It's what we call problem-solving skills in technology-rich environments a very long <coughs> sentence to essentially say digital skills that have to do with using computers in a relatively basic way. And the answer to the question, do the workers have the skills they need, is very often no. This data comes from a survey that actually tests people's ability. It asks them to perform some simple tasks. And what we find pretty much across the board is that uh, a good 50% of the labor force has very little or no ability to actually use simple digital tools. Even in countries that do relatively well when it comes to the share of workers who perform well in the top levels, there is a big chunk of society that is very much impaired when it comes to digital skills. And the second question is, uh, if we have these gaps, how well is current policy doing at filling those gaps? And the answer, I'm afraid, is very often, again, not a very uh, positive one. It's not very well at all. In fact, this, the system of on-the-job training, that's what I'm showing you here, again, a partial picture, a very specific example of skills policy, that we could use, the system of on-the-job training is doing pretty much the opposite of what it should be doing to fill these gaps. The people that have most skills to begin with get most training. The people who have least skills and would need training the most get the least. This is not surprising if you think about it from the point of view of a firm. The firm is going to invest in workers that, have, uh, that are going to deliver the highest return on the investment that uh, they, 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 they do in the form of training. But it's obviously a big uh, headache for public policy. And it probably tells us that uh, in the future we should think about, system that, uh, about systems of training, of lifelong learning, that uh, are going to involve some kind of private, private, public-private um, venture. Because the market by itself, in the form of firms providing training, is clearly not doing the trick. Just to leave you with a sense of what these figures mean, the people who are in the blue bars are the people who have the lowest level of proficiency in terms of literacy, which is a proxy for their ability to begin with. And they're the ones who are least likely to be enrolled in training. The ones on, uh, that are captured by the orange markers are the people who have the highest levels of literacy, so the people who are most able to begin with, and they are most likely to be enrolled in training. So pretty much the opposite of uh, filling the gap. And let's now conclude on the topic of social protection. This is another big headache. It's the one that comes from the last part of the analysis that I showed you, the one about the increase of platform work, the, or, you know, to be true to myself, I should say, the fact that there are a lot of people who are in non-standard work, whether or not they are platform economy workers. And that's why I said this is an issue that has existed for a long time. And the question here is, how well are social protection systems, as they currently are designed, do they, how well do they help these workers should a shock occur to them. 
By shocks here, I mean retiring. Well, you could say that's a pretty predictable shock, but still, it means that you're going to be in need of some form of assistance, in that case, in the form of a social transfer a pension, but also, obviously, invalidity, parental benefits, sickness benefits, accidents at work, unemployment benefits. The overall message here is that the picture is extremely scattered. Countries change a lot in the way they cope with these risks for non-standard workers. And in particular, what I'm going to show you today is that very often for a specific category of non-standard workers I'm focusing on, the self-employed, social protection is very low or inexistent. There are countries that do relatively well at covering these workers and essentially give them the same level of protection as standard workers, so workers with the classic employee type of job, permanent, that we are used to think about as a, a classic form of employment. There are countries who provide the opportunities for enrolling in the schemes but uh, reaching a level of contribution very often that allows you to get back some kind of benefit from the scheme is more difficult for the self-employed than it is for other workers. There are countries that uh, allow the self-employed to opt into some schemes, and there are countries that don't provide any form of social protection at all. And what's interesting here is that you will see that while it's relatively easy for countries to provide some kind of protection in uh, the case of benefits that are more universal, that are not necessarily related to the person's employ, uh, em employment history, it becomes a lot more difficult when it comes to something that is directly related to your jobs, like accidents at work and unemployment benefits. And you could say this is for a reason, because the self-employed very often are not in a position that allows the state to clearly tell whether they are actually employed or unemployed, and therefore setting up a system of contributions that would work with all the problems of uh, moral hazard that there could be, with all the problems of enforcement that there could be. But, and here comes the interesting message, there are countries that do relatively well. So it's a system that in principle can exist. So it's not a uh, utopia, or at least a complete utopia. Obviously, you've got to fine-tune the details. But there are countries that are able to provide good levels of social protection even to workers in non-standard forms of work. Whereas there are others that obviously would need to do some additional work on that front. Let me conclude by um, giving you some facts, again, on the risks that uh, self-employed workers face in the labor market. This is data that comes from the European Union. And it tells us that 54.5% of the self-employed are at risk of not being entitled to unemployment benefits mm -hmm. as a result of what I've shown you before. That 37.8% uh, are at risk of not being entitled to sickness benefit and that 46.1% of self-employed women are at risk of not being entitled to maternity benefits. So you can see these are very big numbers. Whether or not you think that self-employment is on the rise and it's the job of the future. But given that, the risk that it could rise, the possibility that it could rise is there and is significant, it's certainly an issue that we should uh, be working on. Thank you. Well, uh, please stay on the stage. Oh, sure. as, yeah, we are going to have some questions. Yes. Take some questions. Well, thank you very much for this very insightful presentation. It was even better than I remembered uh, from, from autumn when I had the chance to, to hear it uh, at thank the you. first place. And uh, uh, I would like to underline one of, of uh, there were many, but one of your um, conclusions that it's not only about whether the technology the technological developments also create jobs after having distracted quite a many, but it's also about um, um, there is the employment effect, probably, as you said, but uh, it's important to be aware of the polarization and the accompanying inequality that might become an issue. 
And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, the platform um, Economy Employment uh, will be uh, handled by uh, Kaira Holtz after the coffee break. So we are going to hear more about it. And also the, the um, social protection. Uh, we are going to have a presentation about uh, mapping uh, the Estonian system of social protection vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, other countries. Uh, so this is uh, a presentation we are going to have after lunch. Now, I'm happy to uh, initiate um, a discussion. We, are, we, are, um, we have five to six minutes, or a bit more even, to take questions um, uh, to Paolo. Please, anyone wants to ask? Johanna. Võitaga eesti keeles küsida. Sel juhul ma tõlgin. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. My name is Johanna Mailis. I'm an uh, expert at the Foresight Center. Uh, coming to the skills and the job polarization, uh, so yesterday at dinner we had this very interesting discussion where we slightly touched upon the um, idea or the potential of uh, upskilling in the society instead of polarization. Do you think that in some countries it could be probable or there is this potential of, of mostly upskilling and what are the preconditions of this type of change? Thank great. you. Great. That's a great question. In fact, um, it's uh, something that, to some extent, is already happening, has already been happening in some, um, in some countries. In fact, the picture of polarization I've shown you, which was uh, an average figure across countries, conceals very much some heterogeneity, some diversity that exists among countries. And for instance, in some uh, Scandinavian countries, but they're not the only ones, what you find is that uh, the middle is indeed decreasing, but the increase is mostly at the top. So it's not so much the low skilled that have been increasing as a share of the labor market, but it's very much the top skilled that they've been increasing. Mm -hmm. That is obviously a more reassuring development than classic polarization, because uh, while some people are still faring relatively badly at the bottom, that portion of society is relatively small. Whether it can be disappearing altogether is a tough question to answer, and I'm going to say that for the time being, given that robots cannot do everything and that some people still have a preference for humans doing certain things, there is always going to be some need for jobs that are relatively unskilled. Having said that, our wish, our policy aim, should be to have a society where everyone, including those who have a risk of being in those low-skill jobs, have opportunities for moving up the ladder. So this is where, among all the other policy areas that I've been talking about, a good system of lifelong learning, but one that is really delivering tangible results and not uh, something based on the usual rhetoric, we should retrain people and then we pour money into programs that don't work. Something based on proper evaluation of what works, what motivates people, and what delivers results should be put in place. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, there was one thing that intrigued me. Uh, in one, of the, in one of your slides, when you showed the automation potential among different countries, Estonia had relatively modest uh, projections for further automation, but Slovak Republic had the highest. So how come? Well, uh, I would say because you've already done a great job at um, um, making technology so pervasive in, 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 in your society. I think uh, some countries that show lower risks of automation, another one that comes off the top of my head, I believe, is Denmark. They are societies where already a lot of uh, the service sector, for instance, has been uh, automated, where uh, there isn't a huge manufacturing sector, or maybe there used to be, but has been already shrinking mm -hmm. and possibly shrinking earlier than in other societies, and therefore the potential for further automation is uh, relatively low. Having said that, obviously, you always have to read those figures as based on what we currently know about technology. We don't have the crystal ball. We can't go beyond what is reasonable in terms of predictions. And therefore, if technology becomes able to do things that we cannot even imagine at the moment, those figures will inevitably change. But I'm afraid that's, the, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, going beyond what we at the OECD believe it will be reasonable 
to do in terms of uh, predicting the, the future. Okay. So, yeah, Jano, please. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Jan Arva. I'm from Estonian Center of uh, Applied Research. And I wanted to come back to the um, question of uh, training and retraining, upskilling. Um, and my question is about how effective uh, this program, at least in our opinion, are today. Because uh, you showed a very nice slide where, uh, when concerning uh, in the job training, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Norway was the one that uh, is doing uh, the best on the graph. And then we were somewhere in the middle or the lower ends. Uh, as a matter of fact, our high-skilled people were kind of participating in training roughly as much as the really low-skilled ones in uh, in the Norway. So, are we doing something really wrong, or 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 how how uh, how sure can we be that actually these programs are efficient? Sure. I mean, uh, I guess uh, the take-home message number one from that very interesting question is that uh, some countries do manage to do relatively better. And again, this is a message that when I give an OECD presentation, and being the OECD based on the idea of cross-country comparisons is a very important one to underline, because if anything, we can bring to the table the fact that it's possible to learn from the experience of others. Having said that, what could be that these countries are doing relatively better than others? Well, first of all, let me tell you that there's going to be a series of studies on lifelong learning produced as part of this project is going to be come out, coming out in next year. So at the moment, I'm basing my answer mostly on what we, learned, what we know so far and on my personal views. But there will be more, obviously, um, coming out. And I think it's essentially a mix, of the res a mix of the resources that are put into these programs. So for reasons to do with uh, a better understanding of the importance of training, a better understanding of uh, the way that society will benefit from training and such programs, both the public and the private sectors in, and the sector in countries like Norway, say, have a strong willingness to invest a higher amount of resources into the trainings. And then I think they do a better job, and this is trickier to achieve elsewhere, at motivating people. So in societies like uh, Scandinavian societies, very often, my sense is that uh, people have a better attitude, first of all, towards providing training and towards participating in training, because possibly, this is my own interpretation, the fact that they have a relatively flexible labor market and they've had one for many years, makes it so that people have internalized the idea that training and retraining and moving and uh, adapting themselves to the changes that the labor market might bring about is an important part of one's life, as opposed to countries that still have uh, relatively inflexible markets where you're either super protected and you're never going to lose your job, or completely unprotected, but should you lose a job after being so protected, the last thing in the world you're ever going to want to do is to retrain, because you're just not used to the idea. You've just uh, been put in a situation that for many people is essentially an extreme shock to absorb, something that is very, very difficult to deal with, and that I'm afraid very often also carries a big social stigma. You have been fired, you are in trouble, you become someone that uh, society has, um, that, 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 that has failed, essentially. And my sense is that there are societies, there are countries that are better at dealing with these cases, with all obviously the due limitations in those cases as well. I'm not, I'm not claiming that uh, uh, Danish unemployed the people are the happiest people in the world and you know, they're going to be um, you know, um, dealing with a situation that is ultimately a very difficult one for them this, as well in a completely different way. But I find that uh, perhaps the fact that these societies tend to be a bit more inclusive overall makes it, more, makes it easier for many people to accept the situation and to take next steps. Well, um, yeah, a quick last question. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula, for a very interesting presentation. We uh, thought public policy at Uber. Uh, you know, you spoke about what 
countries need to need to do in terms of uh, creating you know, modern uh, policies. And uh, I was glad to hear that you know, many issues are you know, echoing our you know, uh, white paper on future of mobility that we recently issued. And, and we as a platform, we already do things that we think are important. For instance, opt-in schemes for uh, driver injury, insurance or private pension, uh, pension schemes and, and similar things. But from your perspective, from OECD, what's, what's the role of platforms in, in, you know, in, in, the, whole, in the whole debate? Yeah. How can we contribute or work together with policymakers? I mean, there is a big role to play, I, I, I find. Uh, I think platforms can contribute at different levels from uh, the delivery of some of these uh, benefits, insurance type uh, assistance by the technology, by virtue of the technology they have, to contributing to the debate around these issues and so on. The one very important piece of contribution that I would say platforms can make, and I, I personally would say that's, that's the number one issue, is the fact that uh, by virtue of uh, the great wealth of data that the platforms have, we can develop social protection systems that are better tailored to the situations of workers. Essentially, we can learn what the needs of those workers are. And that's a call to perhaps be a bit more willing to share the data where possible. I know that Uber has been doing a lot of effort in doing that. In fact, we've been approached by Uber ourselves, and we're now in contact with the, some people at Uber. But even more of that would be important. And second, the data is key to understand who needs social protection and who doesn't. So again, the tailoring of the system to the actual needs. And therefore, a partnership with the platforms, between the platforms and the state that works, would be absolutely fantastic because it could help deliver social protection that otherwise would be very, very difficult uh, to design. That, that's, that's, I think, what the most important contribution could be. Well, I need to close down the discussion at this point because of time constraint. Thank you so much for all this food of thought that you have provided us uh, now and today. And uh, we would be most glad to, to keep in touch with you also um, uh, in the future to, to have an idea what the OECD is, is further uh, studying. In fact, on, uh, on that note, very briefly, I'm going to say that uh, this is very much ongoing work. As I said, we're going to be releasing an entire employment outlook next year. Should you be interested in uh, seeing some more of these materials or to contribute with the experiences that come from uh, your country, your ministry, your firm, your company, please feel free to get in touch because we are still very much at the stage where we're also gathering ideas. So we'd be more than happy to um, integrate contributions that come from other parts of uh, the academic world, the policy world in our work, because ultimately the OECD is essentially a think tank that is at the service of the countries that uh, are part of it, and not only those. And we're very welcoming when it comes to external contributions. So please feel free to, to get in touch. We'll got, keep that in Thank mind. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.